I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 1st of August, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. Today is the final day of our three-day private tour that we were doing, and that's keeping us awfully busy, but we're also, not only am we gonna bring you the details on that, because I think it's interesting, and we'll talk about what we did, but we're gonna talk, because there's some questions today, about uh, tele telephony and telephone access for remote workers or anyone who needs to make and take American or Canadian calls while living or working in Nicaragua. So we're gonna to get to that right after the bump. Get up on your feet, this is a shakedown. Order up that beat just like a takeout. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about the tour that we did. Uh, this was We did it for the last two days. We've been uh, driving around the country on the Pacific Coast and doing a private tour to look at where may be interesting uh, for a couple who's looking at potentially moving to Nicaragua or somewhere potentially similar, and especially somewhere near a beach with fishing and a place to kick back and relax. So this morning we started off in, uh, in Las Panitas up here in the Leon area uh, because that is where I live. I'm able to stay at home. Uh, and we got up this morning and got moving relatively early. The last two days we've had some communications problems. Today we knew that that was going on and they were already on the Wi-Fi at the hotel so it was easy for us to communicate. So they got breakfast ordered and we headed down to the beach while they had breakfast ordered. We ordered from the road so we were able to eat more or less at the same time and they weren't in a huge hurry this morning because we're our plans are mostly just to head back uh, towards San Juan del Sur where they're spending the rest of their vacation. This is kind of the deep dive uh, three-day um, um, decision-making or research portion of their trip and then much of it is uh, a vacation and it is also their wedding anniversary so happy anniversary guys that is coming up I believe either the day that this video comes out or the day after. So we had breakfast and we managed to sit out on the beach and relax for a little while. And I was able to do a few things that needed to be done at the hotel, saw some friends and hung out, uh, like our friend who was at the Ipico in Managua. He was there hanging out for the weekend as well. A lot of people do come down from Managua to spend time on the beach in Las Panitas. It is a popular place, even for Managuans, even though it's a two hour drive and Managua has its own beaches get a little bit of a different vibe up in Leon and some people just like getting away from the city and being away from the the, the more common Managua crowd so the Leon beaches do work out well for Managuans who are looking for that not horrible drive but don't want to be hanging around with the other Managuans as well so we see a bit of that which of course defeats its purpose to some degree because there's lots of Managuans there but there's the majority of people are definitely from Leon and some from Chinandega uh, primarily and uh, if you're coming from like Madagalpa Esteli it's common to come to the Leon beaches because they're are the they're the nicest ones that are easily accessible coming down that path because they come through Tolica and it takes them much longer to get to further beaches such as uh, Managua or Chinandega they would they would easily add an hour to an already long trip so they tend to come to the Leon beaches uh, quite a bit after hanging out on the beach for a little while getting to relax we got into the car around about noon and got underway it is a pretty long drive from here in Sutiava out to the beach is a little bit under 15 minutes so by the time we do the round trip that's 30 minutes of driving from Leon here down to San Juan del Sur is four hours. So at a minimum, we're doing 30 minutes to go pick them up and then eight hours round trip to take them to and from San Juan del Sur. That makes for a really long day of driving, which is very doable, but I've been driving a lot over the last two days and I had almost no sleep before that. So it is a bit of a challenge just to get to everything. Oh, the sun is suddenly out. We had this nice overcast for a while and we just had the sun cut through the clouds a little bit. It's a little bit in the afternoon here. And uh, so we got underway, we had a very nice day for the drive, uh, made it down to the Hinotepe area. And while we were coming through uh, Didiambra, uh, we were kind of like, hey, are, are, is anybody feeling like much? Like we did breakfast, but it was kind of like 10, right? 10.30. And this is more like pushing two o'clock. It was actually, it was later, it was three o'clock. And uh, I said, is anyone looking for dinner? Do you want to go on to San Juan? And they're like, oh, no, no, we're actually thinking food is good. So I pulled over and I'm like, okay, I only know so many places and we've been to some of them. So let's look at a map and see. And I saw that there was a place that looked actually interesting and had some good pictures for food, like right across the street from like right where I had pulled over. And I'm like, I keep seeing this place, but I know nothing about it. And we passed the pictures around and they said, let's give it a try. 
So I did a U-turn and pulled in. So we went to, uh, if you're looking at a map on, uh, so in the, where the Pan American comes through the departmental Carrasso is two main cities. In the west is Didiamba, which is spelled with an R and it's pronounced, it's, I, there's no way for me to correctly pronounce it. It looks like Diriamba and it is pronounced in the local accent where the R is very hard hit. So it's essentially a light D. So it's very difficult for me to get correctly, but it's Diriamba. And uh, that's the, the Western city. And then it's satellite or it's, it's sister binary city to the East is Hinotepe. And then North of Hinotepe is San Marcos. The three together are the core Carrasso cities. They uh, function as kind of a single metro area together. And that's one of the things that makes Carrasso unique compared to many of the departmentos here in Nicaragua that it doesn't have a single major city that uh, controls the departmento. For example, Leon here in Leon, Granada and Granada, Managua and Managua, Esteli and Esteli. Uh, um, and so that's that's normally how it works. And there's very few outlying cities, but in Carrasso, it is these three relatively similar sized cities. Hinotepe is the official seat of government, but they all are equal equivalent to each other more or less. Uh, San Marcos, I believe, is the smallest of the three, and it doesn't sit on the highway, but they're all, they're super close. Their metro areas just touch each other. All that to say, as you drive from Didiamba to uh, Hinotepe, in the middle are a couple tiny little villages, and you don't really notice. All this blends together when you're coming down the highway, but right in the middle of the two is the very small village of Dolores, and in Dolores, on the north side of the road, is a hotel and restaurant complex called Dos Visiones. And uh, so that's where we stopped, and they have a restaurant, they have a cigar uh, lounge, they have a whiskey bar, which here whiskey uh, with any is scotch. Uh, so they have a scotch tasting room, which is really fancy, which is really shocking. They have the cleanest, nicest bathrooms we've ever seen in Nicaragua. They have a hotel uh, in the back, which uh, we didn't go look at or anything, but it seems like it has a kind of boutique villas uh, as a style. The whole thing was incredibly nice. We were so shocked by how nice this restaurant and how out of place it is. Not that this area in between Didiamba and uh, Hinotepe isn't really nice. It's full of mansions and, and estates and it's absolutely gorgeous. I love the area. Love the area. I love each of the cities is great and then this area between them is fantastic. So it, it makes sense in that way. But when you're coming down the highway, there's a lot of like street markets and, and ferretarias, you know, hardware stores and this doesn't really fit and they have a huge wall and you couldn't even pull in. I had to just park on the side of the road in front and we walked in. It was so out of place and confusing that we actually sent Marcella up. She went and talked to them. She's like, are you open? And they're like, yeah. And she's like, can we park? And they're like, just leave the car by the road. And we're like, what? And then we walked in and it's big steps and it's stone facades and lots of glass. I mean, this place would not be out of place. It'd be a little bit small, but not out of place in like Napa Valley or Baja's wine country. So really threw us off because this is not a style you see in Nicaragua. Even when you do Nicaragua fancy, this isn't what you get. So this is extremely out of place, maybe in Managua in, in uh, uh, Santo Domingo or something like that. Uh, you, you might see something like this. Really, really surprising big spaces. They had a, a sitting room with a fireplace, not something you typically need here. Uh, they had kind of a hunting lodge vibe, but just silhouettes of things, not like actually dead animals. The restaurant itself was very large. We were the only people there, but of course it was a little bit after three in the afternoon, so it was not a very busy time. We were surprised that we were the only ones there, however, uh, but we went in, got a table, um, and very, very nice. Everything was exceptionally good. Uh, the menu was very small, probably because it was a lunch menu in the middle of the afternoon, but they had what we were looking for. Uh, everyone was looking for steaks, except for me being vegetarian, but uh, they had things that I knew I could eat, which today, same thing as yesterday, tostones con queso, but I do like tostones con queso, not a problem. And the style today was very different than yesterday. Uh, so a little bit of variety anyway. So uh, I got that, they got steaks and the steaks were not uh, exceptional. Um, there was, uh, our guests got porterhouses, which they didn't really prepare great, but the meat was good. Uh, uh, Marcella got the churrasco, which is the Nicaraguan style. Uh, and she said that was pretty good. My tostones were very good. The whole thing was, it was a good experience. Uh, and we were really amazed by the bathrooms. The bathrooms were so clean and so nice and so fancy, uh, better than most places you'll find in the United States. Um, certainly not the best you'd ever find in the United States, but really impressive. The thing that was very funny though, and there is a picture that we got of this, we were all like, we have to go into the bathroom and take a picture. They have toilets, but the toilets are on pedestals. So they're extremely high. Even a relatively tall person like myself, like I'm, not, I'm average for the US, but that makes me very tall for here. 
I'm not sure how I'd actually use one. My feet would be dangling, so that's weird. Uh, but other than that, everything was was really, really nice. We are impressed with the restaurant, and it was a neat stop in the middle of the day. And I think it's great as, as places like this, um, when you're traveling around Nicaragua, it's easy to end up at a lot of the local standard places uh, because there's so many of them, and it's what you do, and that's great. And I think it's important to visit those places and get a feel for it. This is likely what your everyday bar or restaurant is going to be. This is what your towny bar, your hangout kind of place, see your friends kind of place is going to be like but it's it is important to get into these completely out of the way places and be like now as you're driving down the Pan American Highway in the middle of Carrasso where you would never expect something out of the ordinary there's this incredibly out of the ordinary fancy place and it's just you know a few blocks probably a five minute drive or less from Cafe Alicia which is an amazing uh cafe with, with a large menu and they have similar styling like really fancy big air conditioned spaces and and big outdoor spaces and just really really not what you're expecting in the middle of the city but super fancy these things exist popping into them and giving that impression of here you are in just the normal city and bam now you're in this crazy fancy place you step outside and you're like what am I? And then you step inside and you're like, holy cow, this is not what I imagined in the middle of Nicaragua. It's good to have those experiences because it gives you an idea of how much is hiding behind the walls and that may be waiting for you to discover throughout the country. Uh, but it also gives you that uh, feeling of, oh yes, if I want to do things in a different style, that's accessible to me. It's just that Nicaraguans aren't normally doing that because it's not what they're interested in. They're not exposed to it. It's not the style that they, you know, we like it in the U.S. because we grew up with it. And it's like, oh, well, I miss it because it's it's comfortable for me. But to Nicaraguans, it's exotic and they're not necessarily looking for it. Sure, they like it from time to time, just like we like coming to Nicaragua and going to Nicaraguan places. But there's a certain comfort to that familiarity that for them means going to Nicaraguan style places for us means going to this. And, and it's great to know that those options remain available to us when traveling or coming here uh, to live as expats. So that was a great lunch. That was, uh, I'm really glad that we stopped. It was a great discovery in general. From there, we headed on down to San Juan del Sur. Nothing really to mention. It's just the drive. Um, like I said, it's about two more hours, which put it, by the time we had eaten, it was about 6.30 by the time we were pulling in, maybe a little bit before, into San Juan del Sur, which means it was dark. We actually had and I need to do a video about this, about the dangers of driving at night. Um, I, I know some people have said you can't drive at night in Nicaragua, and that is not the case. But you do need to be really cautious. And I want to do a video and, and kind of cover that because it is something you need to be aware of. I've lived in Romania, and I would say that was actually worse, but maybe I got used to it, and this is just as bad. Uh, but one of the things that we do find in the darkness is there's often large things in the road. Of course, the scariest is the dogs and cats because they're realistically what you're going to hit because they're out there in such numbers. Now, you don't hit them every day. They're great at getting out of the way. It feels like it's going to be much worse than it is. But the reality is there are many, many, many animals in the road and people all the time. And of course, you're in the darkness. You can't see them. It, it's very dangerous. However, the things that are dangerous to the driver are when you have things like horses and cows in the road. And on the road to San Juan del Sur, we had both one right after another, multiple horses just standing in the middle of the highway, and then an entire, very small, but an entire herd of cattle in the highway. And we had to maneuver around them uh, very slowly which is not a problem if you see them, but often you can't see them until it's too late. So you have to be very, very careful and not drive too fast. All the people you see driving fast, they're literally just willing to kill things, right? There isn't, there isn't like this, oh, I can handle it, I'm good. No, they're just taking risks. And, and sometimes those risks are cattle and sometimes they're children because there are people in the roads. And, and a lot of times it is families on dark vehicles who can't afford to fix their lights and they have kids on those vehicles. You need to be really careful. It doesn't matter how much you think you can handle it, you can't. So the driving at night thing is really about being cautious and being realistic and accommodating the range of potential factors that are out there and not getting cocky. Um, there are a lot of people who get really, really dangerous out there for no reason. There's no need to be impatient. You're in Nicaragua, take your time. But we were fine, drove around them, we're used to it. It was not a problem, but I got a real sense of foreboding as we did it and I said, this is so many things in the road and this is such a bad area because the driving in San Juan del Sur is really, really bad. You get a lot of people who are in a hurry, a lot of people who are drunk trying to get back to town a lot of people who are aggressive, a lot of expats who don't know how to drive in the area. This is a spot where you really don't want things to go wrong. And I'm like, I just know when we drop them off and come back that we're going to uh, discover a problem. 
So we got into San Juan del Sur, they're staying in Talanguera, dropped them off at their hotel, made sure they were good for the night, and uh, we got back on the road. Uh, we I should mention, we did stop. There's a new Pronto just before you get to the San Juan del Sur. So heading south on the right, which is the west side of the highway of the Pan American, there's a new Pronto. It's a Uno gas station with a Pronto Mini Mart, uh, which is really handy for hitting the bathrooms, getting coffee, uh, last minute snacks, whatever, fueling up just outside, uh, just before the turn to San Juan del Sur. Of course, if you get into San Juan, there's gas stations, but out on the Pan American portion, as you come through there, there was always a gap there, and that's been addressed, and it's a very nice place, but it's a drive-up Pronto. It's the first one I've seen of those, meaning a traditional Pronto is just like a Mini Mart in most of the U.S. If you go to a gas station, they've got the market, and you walk in, get your coffee and chips or whatever, and, and bathrooms. Um, here, the bathrooms are outside, which is fairly common, but they have it like a drive up. So you actually drive up a ramp and go past the mini mart and you go to one window and like place an order in another window and pay and they hand you your stuff and you do a loop around the building and then back out of the parking lot. Of course, I don't like to do that. So I just walked up and there's no one else there. So it didn't make any difference. It made their lives much easier, but it's designed for you to drive by. And I haven't seen that yet here. So that was interesting. And we got coffee and that was good. Uh, so we dropped them off in San Juan. We were heading back out. And as just before we got to the highway, exactly where those cows were. And I don't know, I did not see any cow involved, but we didn't see any other vehicles involved either. A motorcycle had had an accident, a very dramatic accident, uh, right in that space where I thought someone was going to hit a cow immediately and the timing would have put it that those cows would have had to have been very very close at the time and of course always in Nicaragua if there's an accident yes the ambulance gets there but so do all the crowds from the neighboring village or whatever and so you couldn't even get down the road there were so many people standing in the road and they'll just walk into traffic without looking because they're so focused on trying to see the injury uh, that they will just walk into traffic blindly. They won't think twice about it. And so the chances of clipping someone, I mean, obviously you're sneaking by, so I'm not gonna like drive over someone, but the the chances of not clipping someone with a mirror or something is really hard because they'll just look away. They'll back into the car as you're driving, like c completely oblivious to the fact that they're in a road and cars are coming and going. It's it's crazy. That's how people get hit in the first place, right? The the self-preservation level is extremely low uh, throughout the country. It's a, it's a major cultural difference. Americans are so like, I'm not getting into the road. There's cars. And Nicaraguans are like, cars? Who? What? What is that? Right? Until you get hit by one, you don't care. Uh, the drive back was a little bit tough because it was uh, dark and late and holy cow was I tired, but did okay. Had to get out a couple times and just kind of run around the car. Stopped in Hinotepe and got uh, coffee and snacks as we go back through. It was a very nice evening. The weather was like 25 degrees. Very nice and cool. Had the windows down. It was, it was a pleasant drive. So uh, got back around about midnight and if you watch yesterday's video, I was really tired as I made that video. It was like two o'clock in the morning that I was recording that. And it was like three or four o'clock in the morning by the time I got it uploaded, ready, and was able to go to bed. So now I've slept and I'm feeling quite a bit better. I've had more sleep last night than I have had for months, probably. If not nearly so, um, I had one night that I can remember of five hours. Last night, I finally got six hours and I really never will sleep eight, so six really feels good. I'm so much more energetic today, so much more. And I've and you're seeing me after I've worked all day. Uh, so it's, I'm doing much better. So I want to talk about, so we got home, everything's good. That was the evening. I wanted to talk about phones a little bit. We talked about this before and we were talking yesterday about the problems with Verizon and someone posted, well, if you're going to be working remotely, and this could be Nicaragua, it could be other places, but Nicaragua presents its own challenges, of course. And uh, they're saying, you know, we how are you going to deal with getting calls? Because when they dial, when uh, customers call internationally, they get a tone that lets them know something's up, like you're, that you're international or whatever. And how do you do this? Well, so this is important. And, and I know that the topic is for digital nomads or those who are working remotely, which could be permanent movement, right? You're moving permanently to Nicaragua or somewhere and you want the ability to work remotely. So you may not be a digital nomad. You may be simply a one-time digital immigrant. Granted, um, but this also applies uh, to the expats or anyone who's living here a significant portion of the time. Doesn't have to be full time, uh, but anyone who's getting beyond the "I'm a tourist on vacation" mode, which is an awful lot of people. Um, and even if you come here as a vacationer, there's a really good chance you're going to turn into a longer, longer stay resident because. It's paradise, and once you realize how easy it is to stay, a lot of people just do. It makes sense. So when we're dealing with phones, the most important thing is, is conceptualizing what we're trying to do. And the thing that we're trying to do in the modern world is we're trying to avoid it being international. 
when people have problems with their phones, it's universally that they're trying to do something in an international way. For example, having a phone number in Nicaragua that's a Nicaraguan number and somehow forwarding calls from the U.S. to that number. You're making an international transfer. You have a Nicaraguan phone involved. Or using a cell phone, which is a locality-based device. It doesn't, uh, it isn't locality agnostic based on its phone number the way that traditional phones are. It detects towers. It negotiates deals. It does weird things. Not that they're wrong. It's just, it's weird to compared to other types of phones. It's unique to cell phones that it identifies where it is, negotiates a deal with the local carrier, which could just be the tower, it could be a big company, it could be any number of things, and then uh, does what it needs to do based on that. that that's different than other kinds of, of devices. And so cell phones, even when you're in the US, are generally not considered a business device. Real businesses, universally, don't let you use cell phones to make and take calls. They present so many problems, from dropping to call quality, because even the best phones, with the best service, your phone call doesn't sound good, right? There's a compression required on the, on the signal for cell phone calls that makes it not sound like a business phone. You can hear people on cell phones if you're on a business or on a modern landline, modern being post 1990s, you can really hear the low quality of the cell phone. So people to some degree have gotten adjusted to hearing this audio quality issue and mostly ignore it but people do subconsciously recognize it. And your phone gives away your location, and it's a private number, it is not a company number. All kinds of things that don't make sense in a business setting in general. My battery died, and sometimes it's just easier to switch cameras from now on the 11 instead of the nine. So we know what not to do. We don't want to use cell phones. We don't want to forward any calls. We don't want to do anything that leverages a Nicaragua infrastructure of phones or a Nicaragua number or any foreign number for that matter. So what do we do? This is actually pretty simple. We use modern phones and do nothing weird. That's it. Behave normally and don't be weird. So what does that mean? Because most people do weird things or they use cell phones, right? If you're, if you're only ever using a cell phone, you may not know what normal everyday real phones are like. So let's talk about that. And let's move into the shadows because the dappled light is a little bit extreme. We had clouds and now we don't. So I don't like this light anymore. So modern phones are different than people imagine. Modern phones always, no exceptions, work over the internet. That means because they work over the internet, instead of being tied to a physical infrastructure, and we don't mean cell phones, those are still tied to a physical infrastructure because they have to be, sort of, but they don't, we're gonna address that too. Uh, because you're not tied to a physical landline of any sort, there's no copper line, there's nothing running to you, you have internet, but your service is not coming over that line, it's just coming over the internet in general, there is no locality to your phone. This means that when you are placing a call, it doesn't matter where in the world you are, as long as you're on the internet, you're able to make that call. Let's think about it in another context. If we were having this conversation about your instant messenger, let's say WhatsApp or Slack or Telegram or iMessage on your phone, on your, on your iPhone, if we were talking about, uh, did I say Slack? Rocket, Matter Most, what about email? Uh, any modern service, Discord, all those. You hop onto a website, you open up an app, and you message people. And the concept that you need to have a different account for a different country every time you cross a border or between states or whatever thing we imagine would never cross our minds. Why? Because no modern system would identify where we are. Why do we feel that way about traditional phones? Well. There's a reason for it is because originally the phone number was assigned based on where you lived and they still assign the country code based on where you're purchasing the service. It's important to understand how this has changed. In the early 1900s when you got a landline, your area code, so I grew up in the 716, the Buffalo area code, you had to physically exist in that jurisdiction and get a physical copper line from a carrier in that jurisdiction, and then your code would be plus one seven one six, and then your phone number address would go from there. You had to physically be there because that number was tied to the physical plant bringing you the copper from that phone extension, and that's how they figured out where to send the calls. As time went on, that system mostly remained for mostly logical reasons. But quite some time ago, with the advent of cell phones, the phone number could no longer be tied to a location because cell phones could move from tower to tower, and it broke that system completely 
practically overnight. So they had to make the phone numbers portable and figure out where your number sat on the system and send the calls there regardless of physical location. So the physicality of the number was broken. But in the case of cell phones, there is still a physicality because it knows which tower you're on. So you're still physically tied to something, but it's not based on your phone number. Now it's an identity. In those cases, they're able to determine what country you're supposed to be in, which one you physically are in, and potentially change how your call works because of it. In the modern world, in the post 1990s, we now make calls over the internet. That means that our connection point is not identifiable. It is simply a place on the internet and calls come to and from it. You can intentionally, you can, you, I'm sorry, you can imply a location based on the behavior of packets, based on the IP address, but you can't actually tell. You can guess, well, this person seems to be in Pakistan at the moment, but you don't know they're in Pakistan. And you know that we use things like Netflix and they try to use those systems to know where you are, but people defeat it all the time using VPNs or whatever other tool. And so that even when they're putting a lot of research and a lot of money into determining where you are, they're never absolutely sure. So with phones, we, have, we now have this power that they don't know where you are are ever. You could look like you're in Pakistan, but just be sitting in your living room in Houston. You could be in Houston and call from Pakistan. You could be in Pakistan, call from Houston. You could be in Pakistan, call from Pakistan. You could do anything anywhere because the thing that determines where you are is no longer about you. It is simply the number. So if you get a US number, let's use the 716 as an example, you get a 716 phone number. Now, no matter where in the world you make a call from, you appear to be coming from the 716. You're identified as from Buffalo, but only as far as where you've purchased the number. Now, maybe only people who are from the United States are allowed to purchase a number from Buffalo. That may be a restriction that you can have any kind of restriction on the purchasing of the numbers or leasing of the numbers that you want. But the, the bottom technological line is once you have a phone number, like from the US or from Canada, and you move, they don't know you've moved, no one knows you've moved. There's no way to tell. Maybe you're going over a VPN, maybe you're just traveling. Any number of things could be going on, they don't know where you are. So the concept of modern phones does not have a concept of international uh, location, right? International calling refers not to where anyone is, it refers to what phone numbers are being dialed. If you're in the 716 in the United States and you dial a, a plus 505 to call into the Nicaraguan phone number system, that's an international call. Even if you're physically in Nicaragua, even if the person with the 505 number is physically in the United States, they don't care where you physically are. That's not part of the equation. It's the, it's the area code. Well, it's the country code and then the area code after it that determines what is international or not as far as calls go. So we have to separate in our minds this traditional concept from 30 years ago that it mattered where we were, and now it matters only what phone numbers you have. So as long as you have a US number and a modern phone system, which hopefully is the only thing you have other than a cell phone, then you have absolutely nothing to worry about. The system takes care of itself. You're an American with an American phone. So for example, my company, because that's where I get my phones from because I don't need to go somewhere else to get it. My company does phones and we have our own phone system. So I have a company phone. It has my home number from the Buffalo area. It changed. It's a 585 now instead of a 716, which I'm very bitter about them splitting our area code and taking away from 1.1 million people the code that we identified with our entire lives. And uh, I simply take that phone and plug it in anywhere in the world and instantly it is still my Buffalo area phone Period. The fact that I'm in Nicaragua is irrelevant. The fact that I'm traveling or permanent, irrelevant. All of those are things we talk about. They have nothing to do with how phones work. Phones only care about the phone numbers you're dealing with. So as long as you have that US area code on your phone, you can be anywhere in the world. And when people call you, they're calling the US. They're not calling Nicaragua. They're not calling Pakistan. They're calling Buffalo. And when you call them, you're not calling from Pakistan, you're not calling from Nicaragua, you're calling from Buffalo. So we don't actually need to worry about this. We only have to worry about having kept our phone up to date. Now, how do you get a phone like this? Basically, you do nothing weird and you will just naturally get a phone like this. The thing you never do, and it doesn't matter if you want to do this or something else, the one rule that should every person, kindergartner should be taught this, you do not ever get a phone with a physical landline. At no point does anybody who brings a line to your house get 
to give you a phone. Those two things should never go together because that means they're finding a way to take away basic baseline phone functionality from you. You want nothing to do with those systems. You can get a line from anyone, make calls over it using an independent phone system. Those things should not be tied together. Now, back when I was first getting a personal phone, we got Vonage. That was 20 plus years ago uh, living in Western New York. I don't know who all the private carriers are anymore, but they're probably still the same ones out there. They are just those companies that give you numbers over the internet, right? That is how phones should be. Everyone who has a phone, that's what it should have been for the last long, long time. If it isn't, it's a good time to invest in one. Having a phone system like that means you can make and take calls from the US or anywhere you wanna get a number from, right? Now that's for individuals. And so that applies to if you're just, just moving to Nicaragua and you wanna be able to have your family in the US make local calls to you, great. You wanna be able to make local calls to them, great. Of course, you could just use WhatsApp or whatever, but we all know there's always gonna be family members who refuse to have a, a smartphone or anything, and you're just gonna to have to call them on some old landline. This is how you deal with that. Now, if you're a business or you're working for a business, you should not be, in normal circumstances, providing your own phone. Your business can provide a phone for you with no effort whatsoever. I know this because I work for a business that does this, right? We're a small business. We are not some huge multi-billion dollar company who like solved some big technical gap, right? We are a normal small business who got a normal, appropriate, good business phone system, and it just does these things magically. Not only is it the cheapest way to do phones, not only is it the most professional way to do phones, not only is it the most reliable way to do phones, it's also the one that solves all these problems just like that. Anyone who's doing something that doesn't solve these, you have to, you really should stop and say, wow, did you come up with a system where this isn't solved? You have to go out of your way and really get things bad to end up in a scenario where this comes up as a problem for a business, right? If you're a freelancer and you're trying to figure this out on your own and all you have is a cell phone, that's why you're running into this problem is because you don't have the business infrastructure, which you wouldn't. But as a freelancer, why are you taking calls in that way? I don't know. Like it's gotta be a specific situation. But for example, if you work here in Nicaragua, even as a freelancer, I got a friend I was talking to about doing this the other day. He wants to be a freelancer. He's currently working for a big company. That big company provides his phones here. So he's able to do all those things because he has a phone from the office. And they don't think twice about it. They had to do nothing special. They simply took their normal phones, handed them one, and it worked. And everyone in his office, hundreds of people, just it just works. No questions, no, no technical issues, no complications, no solving a problem. It just works. If he wants to be a freelancer and he wants to take calls as a freelancer over the normal phone system, which is fine, and depending on the kind of work you do, that may make a lot of sense. What if you're gonna be a web designer, you need to call clients and have conversations with them, and it's probably easiest to use that kind of phone because you can ring their phone, like we're just used to it, right? So that makes sense. So what would he need to do? Well, he could do a number of things, but the easiest one is to simply go to someone like Vonage 20 years ago, I have no idea who offers these now, I'll just assume Vonage still does, and get a number in the United States and use it as his number. And it's just him, it's not gonna scale up. What if he wants to have two people? Well, that's not a good system. You want a business class system, then you come to, honestly, someone like us, but it doesn't have to be us, just someone like us, or like a Ring Central, or like a dial pad, and you get a business phone system with a US number. Done, and you only need one number for your company, right? You might want more, that's an option. You only need one, and everyone can make and take calls over that. The idea that people have limits on phone, this doesn't exist anymore, like right? unlimited calling is just how things work. Right? Don't get sucked into weird complications. If anyone's giving you a phone system and it has problems and it's complicated or it doesn't mean, like, phones are simple. Find a phone carrier who solves your problems just like that and, and doesn't act like they're solving problems, doesn't act like you have a challenge to overcome it. It's just like, um, yeah, that's how phones work. And you go, oh, good, someone who knows this is just how phones work. The default, the, the simply doing nothing should give you a phone that solves these problems really, really easily. If so, if you're in a business setting, if you were a freelancer working for my company, for example, we would give you a phone. It takes no effort to do so. It is so cheap and so easy and so effective and lets you call around the company with unlimited calls and no cost at all. It allows you to make and take calls to the outside world. It lets us transfer calls to and from you. I can't imagine the scenario where someone's working as a freelancer and needs to take a call and has to provide their own phone. Something's really, really messed up with that. If you're in that scenario, Please pass my, my, my <laughs> email and stuff on to these companies. I would love to come in and show how their IT is failing 
wildly. I mean, this indicates they must have giant gaps in their technology because this is the easy stuff. Nobody should have these problems, not for the last 15 years. Nobody, literally nobody. There's no such thing as a company that can't afford to fix this. There's companies that can't afford not to fix it, not the other way around, because we're talking about the cheapest possible way to do phones. Like this is seriously, how do companies have these problems? If you watch my videos about the people who shut down their website because they didn't know what a web host was, you know, one of the problems with that, you know, people kind of think of this as like, maybe it's a technical thing, maybe they don't understand. No, there is one problem going on and it is that they don't understand business. It doesn't matter if they know the tech, it doesn't matter. They don't have to know what a website is. They don't have to know what a web host is. They don't have to know any of that. What they have to know is you don't just call a random vendor and get angry with them and tell them to shut off their service and say you, you have the problem solved and you hired someone new and just lie about it and then act surprised when something you don't know what it is turns off, it doesn't take any amount of technical information. You can ask a kindergartner, if I cancel a random thing, might it affect me? Should I check what it is before I cancel it? A five-year-old will say, um, duh, how dumb are you, right? That's the kind of, but these are the kinds of business challenges we're often seeing is the, duh, how did you make this mistake kind of stuff? Not technical things, not things someone could get confused about. The call a professional, find out how it works, solve it easily and cheaply. Businesses don't have these problems today. Why, why are we running into this? A little bit of a rant, but it drives me absolutely nuts how many companies act like they're trying to solve something hard when it's just, they've created problems just to create problems. Ah, okay. So if your company can't provide the necessary infrastructure to do the job they're trying to do and they expect you to fill in their technological gaps, that is a huge problem, right? That is just conceptually dumb. But, but if that's the case, if you're in that scenario where you need to find a way uh, to work around that, then you need to uh, provide your own phone. And that could be going to a personal phone service such as Avonage and just getting a phone and providing it that way or coming to a phone services company like mine and getting a business class phone system, which is really not that much different in price. It'll certainly be 10 or $15 more per month, uh, even for a single person, but it does allow you to hire other people. It does give you a support company to call on. Whereas if you go to like Vonage, yours on your own, figure it out. Phones are something they expect you to know, but with a company like mine, um, and, and just <laughs> for information, if you send an email to us, we can disclose this to you and like set you up with who to talk to, but a single one phone, one user, company phone system is about $30 a month. There's a tiny fluctuation, so it depends on your usage, but it's very roughly $30 or less per month. And for most freelancers, it'd be much closer to like 26 to 28. Uh, but 25 is the absolute base if you make no calls on this, but it's pretty straightforward. That's really expensive for a single user. That should sound like an outrageous number to you, but if you want the luxury of a support company and you want the ability to grow in the future, and you, yeah, absolutely reach out to us. That would be great, thank you. I would love that, but I'm not trying to sell that. That's not what makes sense to a freelancer who's coming here. Going to um, someone like Ring Central also probably doesn't work. They're going to be very similar price, maybe even more, and not give you the support. Normal phone companies don't roll in support. They'll say they do, and they technically, if your phone doesn't work and it's their fault, yeah, they're, they'll support it. Like Ring Central, they're great, really good engineers, and they'll solve that stuff. But if you have problems on your side, you don't know how to use it, you don't know how to configure it, your network's having a problem, they're not going to help you. That's on your side of the demarcation point. We're unique or unique-ish that we provide those services as well without a charge. That's what you pay for. That's why you spend $30 with us instead of $10 with Avonage. I can just guess that they're $10, right? I don't know. And But they're, I assume, much less than us because they don't have to provide that expensive support. That's where all of our money goes is in the support that we provide. That's what generates the cost to us behind the scenes. Uh, so that's a luxury service. If that's something you want from us, yes, we would love to provide it to everyone on this channel, please. That would be fantastic. But that is that is not my point. My point is simply go get a good phone and then companies can transfer forward, uh, hand out your number, whatever it is that you wanna do, you will be making calls from the US. And that's the key. It's not that you wanna figure out how to, it's this terminology is what throws everyone off. I want to take and make calls from Nicaragua. No, you don't. That is exactly what you don't want to do. You want to continue making and taking American calls without your phone leaving the United States. You want to be in Nicaragua, not your call. Yes, your voice is going to be recorded in Nicaragua, but that's 
an artifact. The reality is, is that your call is originating and terminating in the United States or Canada, wherever it is that it needs to be, and you can be in an agnostic location and you are simply operating the phone system remotely. Much like if you watch Netflix over a VPN, you're not watching it in Nicaragua, you've VPNed to Canada so you can see full house original series and beginning to end and, and see how, uh, how uh, DJ Tanner grew up in San Francisco. You are not watching from Nicaragua, you're watching from Canada and then watching you watching it from Nicaragua. Okay, now I'm getting esoteric, but that is the point. You, you don't want to be doing this, you're, you're, don't mention the problem. Talk about what good looks like. What good looks like is my calls start and end in America, done. Easiest thing in the world. We do it every day, all day. We're on the phone all the time. If any of you ever do a call with me and you do a phone call rather than another type of call, sometimes we do Zoom and stuff like that, if you're doing a normal call with me online, you'll notice you're calling me in Western New York or I'm calling you from Central New York. When I call, I have multiple numbers. When I call out, it's, a, it's an Ithaca area number and when you call me, it's a Rochester area number, but that's beside the point. It is uh, Western New York calls, all of the calls coming to and from me are happening in the Northeast United States. You have no idea where I am in the world. And it's true, unless you're watching my vlog and know I'm in Nicaragua today, maybe I'm, I'm on vacation in Colombia. Maybe I'm hanging out in Thailand. Maybe I'm in South Africa. You have no way to know because the phone itself is always in in America. Thanks so much for joining me. Please remember, like and subscribe if you'd like to support the channel and get great travel and digital nomad and work remote and being an expat information like this, hit that link above. It makes a huge difference. Buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. If you'd like to reach out for some reason about the phones, yeah, we'd love to take that <clears throat> call. Info at relocatenicaragua.com or if you want information on relocating, you want private tours like we did today, anything like that, that's the email address for that please tell your friends about the show. Post on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Reddit, all that stuff. Like that's, get the word out. People discover the show through things like that. And I will see all of you tomorrow.